Welcome to the Texas York Right Chat. My name is Billy Hamilton, and I am here with uh, Chance Chapman, Ricky Cox, most illustrious Dr. Paul Payton of the Grand Council of Royal and Segments of Texas, and the right excellent, right illustrious uh, David Rogers with the uh, Committee on Work for the Grand Chapter of the Grand Council of Texas. Uh, welcome, and, and thank you for joining us today. Thank Thanks you. For Doing this, Bill. All right. So, uh, do we want to go straight into a couple of discussion questions that we have? Let's do that. All right. So, David, these are kind of warm up questions for you and get your opinion yeah. on some of this stuff. So, the first one's what we've got from some a couple of guys we've asked you some questions is uh, my chapter and council resides, resides in a small town. We usually have to wait six to twelve regular members attending our meeting. How can I help my companions to set ritually provisioned? The, the short answer is study clubs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in our society, well, right now, you know, the whole situation, but unfortunately, in our culture of York Right chapters and councils, study clubs aren't going to happen. The nights. Um, the allotted nights are so compact. We have so many Masons in Texas uh, that are doing the work that 230,000 Master Masons in Texas used to do. We've got one quarter of that workforce trying to maintain 60 to 70 percent of the same bodies that, that they were maintaining. And they're spread thin. So study club nights aren't going to happen uh, without some extreme effort. So I'm going to say, if you can get the guys to stay one half hour after your stated meeting, you're already there. Get everyone to commit to stay a half an hour and work on your rituals. Yeah. That's the easiest study club you can schedule, and it's actually the most effective because you've got the people you want there. Yeah, just kind of like taking advantage of the situation while they're there. Go ahead and plan it while they're coming instead of having to the, the extra nights are just so tough to get people to commit to. Uh, they're already carving out time away from their families for the stated meetings of four or five different organizations they belong to each month. Uh, so uh, utilize the night. Stay there till 9 30, 10 o'clock to everybody leaving right after the stated meeting and enjoy the fellowship. You'd be surprised. We do it at Sigaville quite often. And you truly be surprised at how much fun, and and once you get in the habit, how easy it is to get people to stay. Uh, at the start, you're going to get pushed back like you wouldn't believe. Okay, well, that's a good answer. Hey, David. Our next one is: We have members joining each chapter and council uh, from a festival. What are ways that we can get them to stay active in their home? Uh, chapter and council and keep their interest as well. The, the truly obvious thing that we all know is contact, personal contact. Uh, it can't be one and done. That happens so often with members that go to our brothers, who are now our companions, who go to festivals, become our members, but we don't have that. We have the best intentions, but we truly don't have a personal contact. And an email or a phone message is not that. That's not it. It's never going to be it. It wasn't it when you joined the Blue Lodge. It, it absolutely will not suffice. We think it will. And we see the results. You've got to have a social contact. I hate to use the word mental, but there, there's not a better word. The problem we have with the festivals is we're, uh, you know, you hear the analogy all the time of get, you're getting, you know, it's like drinking from a fire hose. That's the analogy you hear all the time. Working. So someone's got to be able to help that new brother, that new companion understand what they just spent 12 hours of their life going through and absorbing it and making them a, a an integral part of the chapters and councils rather than just being a tangent uh, like they feel when they've gone to a festival and no one's contacting them. And I've heard that word before. Uh, so I use that seriously. We, we 
we are truly prepared for success when we have festivals and we don't have a plan to utilize that new brother and that new companion for each day of the day. Uh, we are prepared for success. You know, I've been stuck at home for the past few weeks due to the coronavirus and all the breakouts and that and so forth. Uh, I really miss spending time with uh, other companions. So what are some ways I can stay active while not being physically present with those companions? Great, great question. In, re in, in regard to that, I'm going to say that I just received an email list from one of the other organizations I belong to. Uh, Masonic organizations with 10 names on it. And I'm calling each one of those brothers. And, and we're, we're uh, casually referring to it as brother to brother check in. And out up the roster, call, call 10 people. I, I called, uh, got hold of seven out of the 10, either directly or family member, uh, at the first night. I had a great in, in the fellowship. And talking about old friends and meeting new friends, it's a, it's a wonderful time to do something we don't normally have time to do, and that's make personal phone calls. Uh, now we have that time. Yeah. Other thing I would say is there, there's nothing to prohibit uh, having something like we're doing a face-to-face. -face um, you have, like, if you have an interaction with a guy that you really like to work with, and he's the principal sojourner, and you're the high priest, Y'all can do a face-to-face -face, just study time. Uh, we can think really outside the box here. I know we can't have um, things where people, anyone can log in to have ritual practice, but you can certainly practice with a brother on your part. Uh, some of the things that we were talking about is having topics. Uh, our guys at Sigaville were talking about everybody logging in and having discussion topics. Just ha ha have something like the caverns underneath the Temple Mount. Uh, the, the quarried caverns have a topic like that, those quarried caverns that are underneath there, and everyone do research on the British people who did the exploration and have a topic night or something current topical like our current uh, the membership in the lodges in the area around there, who's doing the most degree work uh, when we get back on track, who do we want to go visit first? Yeah, use it. Long-term planning, uh, discussion topics. But most importantly, for me personally, I think it's a great opportunity that we have that we can work on parts with our brothers and do interactions between the overseers and the senior deacons. That's that's fun stuff. And uh, uh, be imaginative. You have a have a piece of paper. You hold up. That, that's your square. You know, the good and square work. You know, I just uh, go with it. Uh, there's no limitations on what we can do with the the. Uh, video format that we're allowed with a new computer system that I'm totally unacquainted with. Thank you, Billy, for hooking me up on Paul, most shiny sir. <laughs> well, that's good, Nate. Uh, that's good advice. I hope the companions that are listening to us uh, pick up the phone and call some of the other guys that they haven't seen in a while. Uh, always a good idea to reach out to the guys. So. Absolutely. Just like Millie said, uh, we're lucky enough to have David Rogers with us today, who's been on the committee on work for how many years now, David? Uh, 12, uh, well, 13, 12 years, 12 years. 12, 13 years, so. Uh, this, is, this is my 13th year I'm working on. We're glad to see that you're finally getting involved in Mason. I, I believe in the Peter principle, and I have risen to the level of my incompetence, and I'm very happy there. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. So can you kind of tell everybody, what if you had to do a Masonic bio, when were you, what lives did you join, and so forth? How did uh, it start? I, I, well, the, the, the really neat thing about my Masonic bio is I grew up in a Baptist church with all my father's friends who had Shriners pins and swearing compasses on their jackets and and men actually wore jackets to church back then. I don't particularly care for it now, but it was pretty cool in the 60s. All my dad's friends were Master Masons. My uncle Harold was a Master Mason. Uh, the, the deacons in the church, the men that my dad worked with, and my father had great respect and enjoyment with them. So I joined Demolay. And when I joined Demolay, the Demolay advisors were just great guys. And I, it was just a pleasure to hang around with them. Um, 
So when I turned 21, I petitioned. I asked one of the the my uh, like brothers. I asked his father for a petition, and he wasn't even a member of the lodge where the Dean Lake chapter went. So I joined a completely different lodge. I joined, and happily, I joined Archie Buck and the Sonic Lodge. Uh, and uh, 1977, I, I received, it took them six months to figure out. I turned my petition in in June, and I got my uh, inter press degree in December that year. So they really checked me out, guys. I want you to know that. It was a, it was a tough decision. Uh, and then, obviously, being a 21-year-old guy, I took I took a full year to get my master mason's uh, degree in December of '78, and then um, went right into the York ride in the spring of '79. Took my degrees uh, individually, and I'm, I'm not no no dispersions being cast on festivals. You guys know I work them. I'm just awfully fond of, of being able to confer the individual degrees whenever possible. But I support festivals and will continue to do so. Uh, joined the chapter and council in uh, 79. I took my commandery uh, uh, orders at a, a group. It was a parent, uh, excuse me, like similar to the Parent County York Right Association. Uh, we had a Dallas County uh, York Right Association, and, and we had a very large festival in the old asylum at the uh, Dallas Masonic uh, Temple. And uh, it just blew me away. and. I really have been, uh, I've joined the Scotch Rite, Shrine, uh, Grotto, Eastern Star, on and on. But York Rite has been my passion uh, because it is a true continuation of the, what I really enjoyed in the Blue Lodge when I first joined R.C. Buckner. I went into R.C. Buckner Chapter and Council and Dallas Andrew and uh, still members at all. Well, I see, you know, you kind of been real active in the York, right? Especially, uh, I've had discussions with several guys throughout the state all my years in masonry. Is you find your niche, whatever it might be, just Blue Lodge, Shrine, Scottish Ride, York Ride. Find your niche, you just kind of uh, tend to stay with that, that you feel comfortable and you really, uh, not saying you don't like the other ones, but you like, you participate more in one than you do the others. It makes sense. Uh, we all have that. I, I was on, yes, you're right. I was on the hit list in Scotch Rock because I was on nine degrees at one time. We were supposed to be on three. So, yeah, we do tend to do everything that we possibly can. But uh, I, I, honestly, the degree work in the chapter and council just is, uh, to me, it's so fulfilling to my first three degrees in masonry. Uh, it's just where my heart lies. Well, that's good. What uh, kind of get a little personal with you here? Uh, what what do you do outside of uh, What do you do for a living? So forth. I, I work in a welding shop. Uh, I was a quality control manager here for ten years, and now I'm a a, 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 a consultant, and I enjoy it. I, I, I worked for International Harvester and International Dealer for twenty five years in the truck business. And just went to work with my brother uh, for no apparent reason. And, and <laughs> I work for my sister, man. That's all about it. <laughs> and my brother, I, I, I will always say I left the good people and I left the good people. And I, it's been a delight being here for 18 years, and I'm going to retire from here. Um, uh, steel fabrication, welding shop, uh, code vessels, pressure vessels, steam boilers. Um, that's my business. Uh, the evenings uh, when I used to be able to, I was a, an evening volunteer at the Scotch Rock Hospital, and then I shifted over to doing special events. And that's uh, my spare time is uh, uh, my family, activities uh, at my church, um, and that's that's about it. Um, I'm I'm a old classic movie junkie. Now, I'll say that I have I have original versions of Casablanca, The Quiet Man, any of the, any of the old classic Citizen Kane, uh, just uh, Hollywood from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, I can I can probably hold a uh, hold on with pretty much anybody other than that guy on the uh, AMC channel who knows everything. Well, well uh, Dave, you got to be careful when you talk about movies around chance. Uh, 
has uh, 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 yeah. never seen the movie Outlaw TV Wells before, so he, uh, he just said went right over his head. Clint was great in that one. Uh, yeah, Chance, you and I need to go toe to toe sometime. We'll have fun. <laughs> you can go, Chance, you can go spend the weekend with Uncle David to learn something. <laughs> Emma and Star will have fun. Quarantine, and I'll start checking them off one by one. No. Yeah. So, uh, you said that you became a member of the committee on work about 12, 13 years ago. That's, that's about right. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll finish this term. It'll be my 15th year, and uh, I'll finish it uh, in 12. I'll finish my term in 12. So how did you get on the committee on work? What was your inspiration to do so? Uh, you just look into it, or uh, you have to go through the election cycles? Tell us a little bit about it. It's a great story, but kind of a sad story. Uh, uh, I've been working with most of the guys on the committee on work. Uh, uh, except for Dale Secor, uh, on a pretty regular basis or irregular basis. And Russell Milliken was wanting to retire off the committee, and he had some health issues, and uh, it wasn't even a year after he retired that we lost him. So that's the only sad point. But uh, the guys uh, on the committee brought me into a couple of their meetings, their mid-year meeting, uh, uh, sat and the work with me and determined that I had a lot of work to do. <laughs> but but they decided that they would put some time in me. And I, I if I would put some time in them, so we worked together for a while, and uh, they asked me if I was ready to to uh, be nominated to take uh, Russell's place on the committee on work. Nobody can take Russell's place, but I took his spot on the committee on work, and um, it has been a delight. I have uh, traveled all over the state. Uh, we don't. We don't, uh, territories mean nothing to committee on work. Uh, Houston, uh, Midland, Del Rio. I, it, we all go everywhere, anywhere we're needed. And uh, I, I was joking earlier, but I have lived to, risen to the level of my incompetence, and I'm very happy here. I, uh, I'm, this is where I want to be. Uh, I didn't know how it was going to work out 12 years ago, but I, I know now. <laughs> so, uh, so, David, what do you see as your biggest strengths, as the biggest strengths and weaknesses of the chapters and the councils in the state of Texas? Uh, you know, honestly, uh, two words, and they're both they're both the same. There's our strengths and our weaknesses. It's 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 our brothers, our companions, and our rituals. Um, we we have so few chapters and councils that can do the work themselves inside their chapters and councils um, and open and close. I, I applaud our most shiny sir, most illustrious started a program this year uh, to, to check and see, to take, a, take a pulse uh, uh, of all the councils in the state to see where we're at. And we're finding it, we're finding all the freckles and all the foil, the, all foibles and follies. Um, we, we know where we're at and we know we're hurting. And, and that's our weakness is our ritual. It's also our strength. We have marvelous degrees. Uh, I was sitting in a room recently and there were seven people in that room who had learned to do the illustrious principal conductor soliloquy. There were seven people in the county that did that three years ago. Uh, so, and that was in one room. So that's our strength is the love that we have for the symbolism of our ritual, but it's also our weakness because we aren't good at it yet, but we're getting better. Guys, I can assure you that the degree work in the state of Texas, and it's not because of me, but from the time I got on the committee on work uh, 12 years ago to right now, it's better. There are more Texas councils that can do the work now than they could 12 years ago. We just need to get better. We need to make a commitment to open and close our chapters and councils ritualistically. Don't meet around the coffee table, brothers. Companions, don't do that. Don't go into the council room and open with a gavel. Read it if you have to, but practice the work. Do it. Take it seriously. If you have a new companion that comes in that just joined you, what what are you what are you giving him? Give him something that he'll remember when he walks out of there. 
Let him be part of, re, of, of, of the rebirth of that council. But don't fall into the habits of meeting at the coffee table and dropping the gavel in the, in the council room. Try not to do that, companions. So, David, so David uh, I've seen over the past few years, I've seen a lot of uh, new guys come in to the chapter and council, and they, they're on fire because they find something in it that they like. But as you said, we still have uh, we still have weaknesses. What? Uh, how do you feel we can best improve those weaknesses? Uh, there's a term I like to use: spark plug. When you have a spark plug that has come into the chapter and council, you've got a situation where some of the old guys are just holding on, holding on, holding on, and if they've ceased being a council or a chapter, and they become caretakers of a piece of paper, custodians of charter, and they've been hanging on to the spark plug to come in. The millennials, uh, the, the Gen Xers, those are our spark plugs, and we've got to give them free reign to come forward. Guys, we need to be not why, we need to be why not. If any of the guys that are my age are looking, quit being the why, be the why not. Be that guy that asks, well, why not? Why won't it work? Let's, let's try it. Uh, why not? We have to, the older guys like me, have to be the ones that are, we, we don't need to be, we need to be sounding blocks, not roadblocks. We need to listen to the ideas that we receive. Yeah, we can inform people if they're doing something that's again the law, but let's, let's, fervor and enthusiasm, that's, when you've got that spark plug and they've got that, You've got to feed that fire. You've got to make them know that you hear what that new companion is saying. Give them a job. My Lord have mercy. Uh, somebody that's my age or 70, 80 years old, and he's been doing the principal sojourner part for 30 years. Hey, guy, take a vacation. <laughs> you know, the, the, hiatus. You know, movie stars, Lord, I live late, took vacations and hiatus. Look, give it to him. Let him do it. Let him stumble and fall. Let him succeed. But put that new companion to work while that strike while the iron's hot. That's the old old guys always used to say. Strike while the iron's hot. You've got to. We've got to turn the loose. We've got to listen to what we're being told by the new companions that are coming in, and and, and just stand back and watch great things happen. Uh, we see it everywhere. We see it. Good night, loving. What a success story that man! The old guys need to just step back and hey, what can I do to help? Let the horses run, guys. There you go. Good advice. Hey, Peter, are you one of those old guys now? You've been around for a while. I'm not wearing glasses today. So, uh, <laughs> well, my my confusion was he was saying uh, millennials and Gen Xers, and I know where Gabe Yogish fits in there. But Billy's kind of a spark plug too, but I don't think he's either one of those. Well, I'm a Gen Xer, so <laughs> uh, I did it right between. I'm I'm one of the worst boomers there ever was. Yes, I'm I'm a I'm a baby boomer, that's for sure. And uh, there, we lost my generation. We lost a great deal of the Gen Xers. Uh, can't lose the millennials. We have a product. We have I don't. Marketing, whatever you want to say, we've got this great product. Fraternalism, it doesn't get any better. And we know that. And we've got to offer that to these young men when they come knocking at our doors and looking for that fraternalism, fraternalism that fellowship and that brotherhood. We've got to be there. We, we've got to deliver the product or they're going to walk on out the door again. I agree. But David, what's your favorite part of your career? Oh, cool. uh, well, I, I, I love to do the principal sojourner part, but I'm getting too old to do it. And uh, and and honestly, one of the, the reasons why I love to do that is not because I love doing the part, which it is wonderful, but the people I've gotten to work with. Uh, guys, it's, it, it's not a comedy show, but it's really hard when you're doing that part where Orville O'Neill is up there and he's got his hands and he's doing this thing while you're talking about 
uh, ascending and descending, and he's doing, and he's he's had that look on his face. And guys, it was classic. I loved doing the principal sojourner part when uh, Right Worship O'Neill and I would be working that. I have wonderful memories of that. Uh, I guess if I had to say just for pure beauty of the part, I love the Bible lecture. Uh, and right in behind it is the past master's charge. Uh, guys, that's that's pretty masonry. Uh, that, that's good and square work right there. And I mean, the sacred history is marvelous. But just for just for a delight to hear the words come out of another brother's mouth, the past master's charge in the Bible lecture. Uh, amazing masonry. Well, David, I'm, I'm kind of shocked. I'm not a or, you know, come on. Hey, I know right shiny thirds. I love the IPCW. The soliloquy is wonderful. It's absolutely fabulous. And it's number three. Oh, okay. You've already said it. So uh, we'll just go right on to the other part now. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, you said earlier that you, you traveled the state thousands and thousands of miles, helping in degrees, giving your private talks, MRCs, uh, out of all those trips, what was the best trip you had, the worst trip, and the craziest trip that you can remember that you can legally tell us? Uh, I can't tell you all the stories, but I can We won't, we won't have to keep out. One of the craziest ones was uh, going down to Del Rio, and uh, Rex Lewis and I, Rex is a marvelous, faithful workhorse. Man, that dude is a fighter. Uh, and Rex uh, and I were going down to Del Rio, uh, one of probably 50 trips he and I, five zero road trips he and I have done through the, my time on the committee. And uh, we decided to go the back roads. And Rex had this Garmin, and he had it set up, and we were following the Garmin along, and and we got to a certain point uh, somewhere out past Kilgore because we were going to go back road. And Rex says, uh, the Garmin says, turn up here. And I said, no, no, I, I've been this way before, Rex. We need to keep going. The Garmin, we passed the road and said, okay. Then it said, uh, recalculate or whatever. And it says, turn to farm to market road so-and-so. And I said, no, Rex, we're supposed to keep going here. And I, I mean, let's keep going. We get about, oh, about 15 miles past the last turn. And it finally says, uh, pull over, make a safe and legal U-turn, and go back to farm to market. So, uh, and Rex just unplugged the garment, threw it in the back seat. Wherever you want to go, Dave. Wherever you want to go. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and we we got lost three different times that trip. We ended up, uh, I think, um, taking ten out towards Sonora and, and being an hour and a half late getting to to Del Rio, and we still had a great time. But that was absolutely crazy. Um, Probably my worst trip was um, the ice storm uh, at Grand Lodge. Uh, didn't have to do with York Rock Masonry other than the Grand Lodge of Texas is the York Grand Lodge of the Republic of Texas. Everybody remember that? And uh, uh, but that was terrible, and that was the year that Rex and David Anderson got in a horrible wreck. And uh, probably the best trips were some of the trips to Del Rio, in the uh, as far as fulfilling when. Uh, uh, Jerry, Rex Lewis, Tim Thousand, and myself, we all headed down to Del Rio to help out with the degrees. And we just, I mean, just, it was amazing that, that weekend. Um, one of the, the most touching and memorable ones, uh, we, uh, Rex and David and I were going out on a trip, uh, work on some degree works, and Rex wasn't feeling well. And we got through early, uh, intentionally, uh, and we went to Tom. Tom Turner's wife's funeral, and uh, on 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 that trip, and Rex was unbelievably sick. David Anderson, as you all know, has neuropathy, and he can barely get around. And those guys never gave up, and they inspire me. I don't, no matter what's going on, those guys show up to play, and they're just that that type of thing is so special. And if you ever get a chance to spend seven hours. In the front seat of the pickup truck with Barry Brunk, you got to do it. And those are just just a few of the marvelous memories from road trips. Stories, guys. You get grab a brother. Go, you know, go down to Battleship, Texas. Go to the to the to the Alamo. Take these Masonic road trips. And take somebody with you. You'll never get to know a brother truly 
as well as if you spend six or seven hours in the front seat sharing stories about family. You got to do it, guys. Grab somebody and hit a road trip. Well, I got, I got one more question part of that story there, David. Uh, yeah. During all those miles riding in the pickup together, was a true story told any time? Uh, first liar doesn't have a chance. <laughs> We we were we pretty much all grew up as fishermen, so you know uh, the he, there's a phrase in masonry that happens, unfortunately, to guys my age and a little older, and that's the older I get, the better I was. Well, fortunately, I haven't quite resorted to that yet, but I may be getting there. I I, uh, I will tell you that I was a terrible ritualist, but uh, they frequently uh, would refer to my work as everybody likes to come see me work because they never see the same show twice. <laughs> and that's pretty true. <laughs> I don't know about that. You're pretty yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, truth, yeah. Oh, I guess a little bit of truth came out. <laughs> so, David, uh, one of the questions I have for you is, as a member of the Committee on Work, would you tell us why the schools of instruction are so important? Oh, wow. The companions being introspective into looking in your own chapters and councils, I think is the key to answering that question. We see the flaws, we see the, the, the loss of the ability to do the work. We see the loss of the ability to do the floor work. Part of the symbolism, uh, we talk about squaring a lodge sometimes. Uh, part of the symbolism of the degrees is how we do this. There's beautiful floral work. Uh, there's the interaction that we teach at the School of Construction, how a brother can, can learn how to do a part to, to uh, something simple as opening and closing a veil. Something as simple as examining work in a professional manner so that a candidate gets the feeling that his work really is getting inspected and that it's not just a throwaway degree. That's the kind of things we try to impart and that love of the work and that, that seriousness of purpose in doing the work. It's not because I want to look good. It's because I want a candidate to receive the absolute best experience he can as a mason. He's my brother and I owe it to him. And so I believe that the schools of instruction are the best way to impart that knowledge. We're, we're, we're struggling with the local level, so we've got to go corporate and then we can work back down again. So David, masonry and life and family and everything, they all, they happen whether you want them to or not, they're there. So what do you do to properly balance work, family, and Freemasonry? Well, and everything else that comes on around in life. Yeah, well, you know, Ricky, with me, probably nothing. <laughs> it's, it's mainly Masonry. No, I'm just joking. Um, my, my great nieces, are uh, they were swimming for a while, and they're, they're on the track team now. And uh, sometimes you just have to not go to that fish fry or not go to that Masonic pancake breakfast, and you need to go, you want to go, you, that, that's have to go, need to go, want to go. Oh, I have to go a lot. Oh, man, I need to go. They got to have me. Or dang it, I want to go. That, there's, that's the only three reasons to do stuff Masonically. And, and, and so when, if it's just that, you know, I need to go. Put the family first as often as you can. Um, when the ox is stuck in the ditch, you can explain to the wife. Y'all got some wonderful ladies. So, man, kudos to y'all. Well, this is bachelor talking. Um, but make time for the family every time. Your brothers will understand, but also understand that when, when the ox is in the ditch, you're going to be there. Uh, so pick your battles. I, mean, I use all the catchphrases and things like that. But also remember you have a commitment. And when you make a commitment as an officer, you need to fulfill that commitment. If you can't continue, your brothers and your companions will understand that you've got to follow through when you make a commitment. But we'll also understand when that, that kid's sick or that, that, that little league tournament's come in, you got to go, guys. you got to go. Uh, we, we have to cover each other. We have to be prepared for that. 
And that's why you can't have just one guy do the pencil surgery in the park. <laughs> well, I got a question for you, David. I know uh, you and the most excellent guy out there, Senator Bass, have been pretty, pretty driving the nail on the roadshow program this year. You yourself have been to Bam, Texas several times as uh, I visited with you up there uh, last month at a state of meeting, but you uh, kind of tell the guys, not everybody on here is going to be a uh, your Pratt Mason, but kind of give an idea of the road shows, what, what that is. Well, uh, first of all, you gave David some credit and yeah, maybe he jump started it. So you got him behind the support and us. You worked on uh, uh, getting charters moved uh, for the different companies. <laughs> You make the visitations, you make phone calls, print flyers. So, kudos to you, uh, most illustrious, or most shining, sir. And you, so you and most excellent have really been supportive of what I like to call the road shows. Companions, uh, y'all all know you, you've been watching it. Some of our brothers don't realize how how far the situation has gotten as far as the lack of chapters and councils is huge for the state. Uh, you can look at a map, everybody can. You leave Sulphur Springs, you're gonna get to Arkansas or Louisiana before you find a chapter of council. You, you leave Longview, you leave Marshall. You're gonna get to Oklahoma before you find another chapter of council. Brethren, that's a lot of real estate without a place to offer some of the most amazing masonry, some of the most amazing degrees. Uh, it, it's just their goal and we can't offer it. We can't. We can't get it to them because we have no place to go. So the road shows are designed to pick lodges in, in areas, vibrant, working, active lodges in areas around the state that don't have a chapter in council within 45 minutes an hour drive and approach those lodges, those vibrant, active lodges, and ask them, guys, we've got this product. We want to bring it to you. We've got this wonderful masonry. Will you host it? Will you be our host for the day? We'll bring everything we need. We just need you to be here to open up. Uh, open your open your building to us and open your minds and your hearts to what we can teach you with these degrees. So when I go out to, to Mount Vernon, to Mount Pleasant, or uh, visiting the different lodges around, I, I'm sharing the message of what these marvelous degrees are and how they can enhance and enlighten you symbolically to the things that you experience in the first three Blue Lodge degrees. And that's what the road shows are about. Are, they're about taking our degrees to areas of the state that are just not intentionally, but they're abandoned by our great York right bodies. No chapters, no councils, no commanders. The commander orders, I, I just, people talk about being a nice temper when I go visit lodges. This is something they know about. It's something we can offer if we take the show on the road. And, and who knows, maybe we replant flags. Maybe we replant a flag in Mount Vernon or Mount Pleasant. Maybe we we replant a flag in Graham. I, guys, I can tell you what will happen if I do nothing. If we do nothing, that's exactly what will happen. Maybe we fail this year. Maybe this because of the coronavirus, this is a total wash. But you know what? We went down fighting, and we'll try again next year or year after. The, the, there's... About 30% of the Masons in Texas don't have a chapter in council within a 35 to 40 minute drive of them or, or more. So we've got to take it to them. We, and, and good for us if we do it and we succeed. All we did is lose a Saturday or two if we don't succeed. But uh, we need to try. That's what the road shows are about. So David, who do you consider a mentor my my personal mentor in masonry uh, when I was yes coming up um, there were a couple of guys that were really uh, kind and good to me uh, brother I F X Thorn who always wore a ball cap that said to he was marvelous um, Morris Rat uh, Morris Rat was a, a wonderful actor you've seen him uh, he, he he helped me a lot. Uh, ben Day was my Dean Lay dad, John Wallace, uh, Dean Lay dad and advisor. 
great guys, great masons. Uh, some are still with us, most are gone. Um, and I used to always joke and say, when I, when I grow up, I want to be Brother Heck. There's a couple, couple other guys that, that have been marvelous. Uh, Orville O'Neill really was, was amazing to me for so many years, a dear friend, and uh, some hilarious stories with him and goofy things. But um, in a great many ways, he was a mentor. Uh, I don't really think of myself as a mentor as much as I consider myself as that sounding block. I don't, uh, I want to hear what the others have to say. Uh, I want them to know that somebody listens especially our new companion that Rick was talking about earlier. Rick, he's got uh, that question about what do we do with the new guys? We've got to listen to them. You know that. You do it. Uh, and that's what us old heads got to do, too. We have to do that. We've got to listen. We've got to be the sound of the body. I hope more than being a mentor that I'm a listener. Yeah. 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 Well, I know uh, you I got my degrees in chapter and council in October, November, and December of 2007. And that's right around the time you the committee. And uh, I don't know the committee on work without David Rodney. But you might say that you don't think you're a mentor, but you definitely are. Uh, you inspire a lot of people. Whether you realize it or not, or want to or not, you do. Moses. <laughs> I got my walking stick in here somewhere. <laughs> it's around here. It's usually somewhere close by. Uh, gosh, I've had so much fun with that walking stick, uh, and both as a prop and as a prop. <laughs> it works both ways. But, uh, well, uh, David, you think you think about uh, the committee on work and the guys that have been on it for several, several years and traveled the state, you know, like Jim Manley talked about. The nitpickers and <clears throat> traveling the state with, uh, you know, just like you said, Orville. And if it wasn't for y'all, you know, you, uh, Oni Weaver, all these guys, I mean, think of where the work would be throughout the state if we didn't have guys like you, Tommy Chapman, Jim Manley, Almont, these guys, Barry Brock. Think of what the work would be like. Oh, I, uh, I work with some of the best guys in masonry and have for 12 years. Uh, uh, Skip D's, Dale Secor, uh, you know, they were they were on the committee, Russ Milligan, uh, when I first got on, uh, and of course, him and Elvin Brooks. Guys, sometimes the impact we make, I mentioned the name Elvin Brooks just a moment ago, and we all know, but those of you who are listening that might not know, he was, uh, he is a past Grand Master of the Grand Council and past Grand High Priest of the Grand Royal Arch Chapter of Texas. But he's he's a difference maker. Guys, Del Rio has he's been gone a number of years. He went down there year after year after year. He and Jim Mann, they kept going. They Jim keeps continues to keep going back. He's never missed going down there. Uh, they they named their school of instruction and their festival each year after two guys, Dean Hildreth and Eldon Brooks. And, and that what a legacy that is that, that they thought so much of the impact that Eldon had on that chapter in council that they named their annual festival perpetually after him and the school after Eldon and after Dean. I, you know, guys, there's a legacy to being a teacher. There's a legacy to to always trying to impart knowledge, but to listening and to helping your brother become better, uh, your your companion become better. And the impact those guys have had has been amazing, and I'm just proud to be part of them. Truly, they're Masonic guys to me. There are a lot of great guys out there, wonderful ritualists, marvelous. Mitchell Ray Jones, uh, and MC Rudolph, Jim Davenport. I can go up. All the old guys are listening. Now they're salivating all the old guys. Now I'm talking about, they know, they know. So I knew too. They're still part of my memory. And they're just, and uh, there's different words I say, like op, I say obstacle instead of obstacle. Um, uh, MC Rudolph used to make it sound like he's talking about an icicle. Yeah, 
we remember those guys, and that's the legacy when we're sharing the companions when we're out there. That it just the impact that those guys had on my life that we're continuing to have it on, on companions around the state. It's just go. That's not exactly the answer of the question you asked, but that's that's a, like a good politician. That's the answer you get. <laughs> Uh, so David, yeah, Rick, Ricky. So, what is the goal? What is a goal or project that the York Rat bodies are working towards? Uh, I would. Besides membership. So the, one, I mean, the one word I like, or the two words I like about this, member service. I'm talking like you're, you're joining the Sam's Club. But uh, this year in particular, I'm seeing member services the last two years. What we can provide our brothers and companions that's of value to you. But also, we're, we're one thing I think that we're doing this year with a lot of the degree work and things like that is, is, is feeding that further through introspection. Looking at the degrees, looking looking what the system is, but that's all part of member services, uh, providing a wonderful quality experience. And I believe that's the goal that the grand officers have right now is providing the best chapter and the best council experience that we possibly can with with the assets we currently have. Again, I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but that's the one I got. Hey, no, that sounds good. Hey, uh, I just, you know, I think that uh, with the lead, with guys, whether you realize or not that you're a mentor, with guys following leads that you have, I think that uh, a lot of goals can be accomplished and not just build our membership, but get people excited in this organization. So we salute you, sir. Ricky, you're so right. It's not numbers. When we talk about numbers, numbers are important, guys. I know we need members. We all know we need members. But more more so than members, we need companions. And the work y'all are doing, the people that I see y'all working with in the commanderies, you and, and, and Chance, and that, 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 that real, uh, I always kid you guys in the black uniforms. I come up and say, oh, there's those black uniform guys gathering together. Chance is laughing because it's true. I tease y'all with that. Um, I love it, that camaraderie. You, you know, I'm not real sure, but I don't think you get that in the Rotary Club. And they're great guys. They do wonderful things. Not real sure you get that in the Lions Club. Not you do. But I'm positive you get it here. And I'm positive you get it when you have an active, vibrant chapter in council. And they supply that enthusiasm that Rick has, that Chance has, that DT has. It's really, my gosh. I, I, I'm sitting here with guys that are spark plugs in so many different organizations, and it's just I, this is great. So, Ricky, you're right. So, David, um, I have a question for you. As a member of the committee on work and traveling all over the state, listening to people do ritual, is there one part that you feel? Um, needs a little bit of work in most chapters and councils? Uh, in, in degree work, uh, the council summary uh, in, the, in the council and in, in the chapter of the Royal Arch Lecture, uh, they're, often, uh, they're often afterthoughts. Uh, I, I would say this, uh, the charges are frequently read. I don't have a problem with reading them. I have a problem with the first time you read it is when you're reading it to the candidate. <laughs> Guys, if, if you're going to read a monitorial part, do yourself a favor and do the candidate's favor. Do it, do it, do it. Read through it a time or two before you're going to do it. <laughs> but make the candidate realize that, that he and you are listening to this for the first time together. <laughs> but honestly, though, the, the Royal Arch Lecture is, um, is often overlooked and it's. Uh, Frequently stumbled through council summary, and which is council summary, monitorial. But uh, um, 
the, the, and then in the lesser, the non-big parts, the conductor, the council, uh, in the in the royal masters, that's that's such a needy part, but it's so overlooked. You know, uh, and the king commanded, and they brought great stones and costly stones and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. You know, put some life in it, guys, because that candidate, he, he, you're going to make it. You're starting the degree, and you're going to make it or break it. And it's not that huge a part, but it's word wise, but it's so significant. Put some life into it. Um, the uh, the overseers, ham it up, guys. It's not. Don't make it a, a comedy show, but put some life in it. Is this, you know, is it yours? Did you, why are you bringing this to me? Put some life in. Um, uh, and no, I've not violated anything. You've got only monocle so far. <laughs> Yeah. Good. Good. So, David, what is the one thing that you would stress to master masons or even people who are not mason about the York Rite that stands out? Uh, besides the ritual, of course, um, what's the one thing that you like to leave as an impression to those who are not York Rite masons? Uh, and it, it, it involves Blue Lodge too, but Blue Lodge through the most right nation. Um, guys, I wouldn't know you can't. I wouldn't know your dad. I wouldn't have known your granddad. I love, I love your granddad. I wouldn't have known him. I would never, I would have never met Ricky Cox. I've never met Billy Hamilton. I've never met Don Paul Page. It wouldn't have happened. I would not have known any of y'all had it not been for me. That goes for hundreds of people. Some wonderful, marvelous people that I have met because I am a Mason, and in particular because I'm a York Rite Mason. The wonderful sim symbolism, the biblical story. We have this wonderful, true book, this Bible, and we take that Bible and we have these wonderful vignettes that we pull, or stories that we pulled out of that, and we make these little vignettes, these, these fictional stories of the uh, Report or uh, esoteric or uh, 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 these marvelous Masonic traditions that we've woven our story into with all this history and all this this Bible truths that we have, and we've got that, and that's marvelous. That's the ritual, but I I, I wouldn't have known you guys, and more particularly, I wouldn't have known you guys as brothers and shared that fellowship as a companion. Uh, it wouldn't have happened. That, that to me is the is the great selling point for for anyone that had my mentality coming to the court. So, uh, David, I had a question about DP that I'd like to ask you. <laughs> but we'll save that. We'll save that. I promise. <laughs> we'll save that for another day. Um, oh, hey, so, David. Whenever people hear masonry, or they, or even York Rap masonry, sometimes people are a little lost as to what we're talking about, how to understand it. But when people hear the Shrine or the Scottish Rite, they clearly understand those organizations. What do we need to do, do you feel we need to do in the York Rite to market ourselves better that when people hear that you're a York Rite Mason, whether it be chapter council or commandry, that people say, oh, I know those guys, they're great. Well, we, we've had many instances where we have have had opportunities to capitalize on York Rite Mason, much like uh, National Treasure. Had, had, we, had we done a marketing thing to tie in uh, the, I know we couldn't steal their name, but to tie in the Knights Templars, and I, that was a great positive Masonic uh, Masonic introduction that a huge number of people in the United States had. They, they knew nothing about masonry because masonry didn't have the same standing in their community as it had for their grandfather. So we, we, we need to seize on those opportunities when they come up again, and in particular, um, the stories, like the wonderful stories going on at the Te Texas Masonic Retirement Center. We need to hit YouTube videos about guys out there on that front line at that gate. That, 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 we, 
those pictures of Gary Rock out there, you know, one of the grand officers, commanders, other guys, uh, you know, uh, doing that. Uh, Zach calling all over, finding supplies, Billy and all the guys working, um, uh, uh, Keith and signing people up to do midnight shifts or whatever. That we need to be posting that on YouTube, on, on Facebook, as much as we possibly can. We're, we're not going to be able to get the same PR press that's signed up to the hospitals, the Scottish Rock Hospital, and, and, and they deserve that. They should have that. But we have the, we have a time to stand too. And when we have these opportunities that come up, we need to seize on them and, and utilize them to our, our market, marketing, our, our label, our, uh, our brand. Thank you. Thank you. That's the current catchword and brand. Um, and it's, and it's true. Whether we want to admit it or not, um, we're in the marketing business and our marketing is us being great brothers and great companions and share. Um, so seize on the opportunities. But the other thing is we need to internally market. We don't visit lodges enough and ask, and ask those worship masters and those secretaries to schedule us in for a short five to 10 minute talk. We don't do that. We, we, we make a passing effort at it, but guys, we aren't doing it or we'd have a better we have a better in, input into our capital council from those lodges if we were really diligent from doing that. I know some do, but we're not universally doing it, and that's another thing we can universally do is hit the lodges down. That's our market. In a, in a, in an abstract, you know, in, any good man of character is in the United States in our market, but you know we got to get them. We got to get them to a certain point before we can land that fish. And the fish are right now in the blue lodges that we aren't just right. Well, well, David, we we got a rare opportunity for you right here. I know I know that sounds like an Amway sales pitch or a but uh, I know you can't travel anywhere <laughs> because the government won't let you. So, social uh, distancing. Social distancing. That is right. So what we're going to do here is give you the opportunity to ask you know, Chance, Rick, Billy, and myself a question that you've probably been thinking, hey, I need to ask these guys a question. But now you have a legitimate chance uh, that everybody's going to hear us answer a question. That you would like to ask. I, I, I would love that. And uh, I'm going to do a little advertising before we do that. I'm just going to remind everybody because we are going to be past this corona, this COVID. We're going to be past it by October. We're going to be good to go. And I want you, all the companions uh, that are out there looking, the Sir Knights, we want to remind you, uh, companions, we're going to be uh, in Waco on October 16, 16 and 17. And we'll be having a school of instruction down there, and we'll be having competitions on Saturday morning, the 17th, in the most excellent master's degree. And we'd love to see you, and more particularly, we'd love to see your chapters, RACP, we'd love to see your chapters compete in the most excellent master's degree at the, at the school of instruction in Waco at the Memorial Auditorium on Columbus. Come be there or be square uh, on October 15, 16, and 17. Uh, we have three sessions a day. Uh, except on Friday, we have two sessions a day morning and two sessions a day afternoon. Uh, that concludes the commercial portion of our broadcast. We're now returning you to the morning. So, uh, ah, see, there we go. <laughs> um, I don't want to double up on a question. Uh, uh, on one, I'm going to ask one question individually. I'm going to start off with Ken, since he's on the screen right now. Uh, I, I wasn't a real legacy. Uh, my uncle was Mason. Um, I had a wonderful surprise when I was going through my father's uh, his, uh, his stuff in his desk, his rifling his desk after he passed away. And I found a petition in his desk. Uh, he was real good friends with a couple of members of Houston Sonic uh, Lodge, and he had asked them for a petition but never followed through on it. And he was so supportive, he came to all the Masonic things, the open meetings, installations, he passed away. 
and he loved that I was active and going to make me so much to me. And my mom and dad presented me my ring the night I came home and being raised in imagination and so I purchased the ring for them and gave it to me that night. So I, I love the fact that my masonry was so important to my family and it supported me. I'm not a true legacy. And I, I know your dad and I know your, your granddad. And uh, I know your granddad was still with you when you were away. Um, I want to ask you that that night, with everything going on in Oakland and everything that was going on in your mind, three work and everything else, but what impact was it on you to, to know that you had those two guys in the room with you probably working in your degree? Um, I, I just want to know what, what went through your mind that evening. So I'll, I'll start at the EA degree. Um, you know, my dad conferred all three of my Blue Lodge degrees. My father was warden, and all three of them. And uh, the junior warden was even fuller a cousin, same for the master of ceremonies. Uh, it was a big family ordeal uh, from the get go. And then going through all the other degrees, uh, my dad and my grandfather were literally a sonic degree I got uh, all the way through the chapter council commandery, Scottish Rite, Eastern Star, uh, several of the York Rite attendant bodies, and so forth until we lost him in 2012. Uh, I think the, the biggest special moment, other than, you know, watching Dad get all this, uh, <clears throat> Grand Master of the Grand Council and then Grand High Priest. Uh, when he was Grand High Priest, uh, I was this Grand Royal Arch Captain and Papa was Grand Chaplain. So we had three generations of Grand Officers right before we lost him. But the most uh, special moment was when I got my Master's degree. Uh, this ring that I wear every day. Paul Paul bought this when he was district deputy in 1974, I believe. And then he gave it to dad in 1983, the night he was raised in Master Mason. And then the night I was raised in Master Mason in 2007, uh, dad gave it to me. So I wear it every day. I with him every day. And those special memories that we had, I had about five to six uh, Masonic memories. My dad and my grandfather at the same time. I wouldn't trade that for anything. Those were the best Masonic years that I've had before. And I've done a lot since 12 on my lost it. For the best right there. Uh, that's great. That's freaking amazing. I, I love that. That's, I, that, I love it. That's great. Um, I'm going to throw one at Ricky. Uh, the politically correct Ricky, I love that. I love him. Um, I, Ricky, you and I have talked before, and I know you had some tremendous obstacles to overcome in your life growing up. Health issues that people wouldn't believe unless they sit at the table drinking a cup of coffee with you. No one would believe the obstacles you had to come through to overcome physically. Uh, so, with all the, the things that have happened in your life that brought you to the, to the moment when you asked, a friend to be made a mason. Um, of all those things that led up to that, when, when, if you look back in, in, in retrospect, do you see the connections readily or did it not come to you until after you joined that you saw the connections that led you to that point? <coughs> Pardon me. I have to uh, yeah, check my temperature here in a minute. The uh, <laughs> I so, wish the thermometer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was one of those things where the reason I didn't even know what a mason was. And uh, the reason I joined was because I was going to school and there was these men there and they actually belong to Olive Branch Lodge, so which is right down the road from me now, but I would have never guessed. And the one thing that I noticed, they always, they tried to help me no matter what. And growing up, I'm not going to lie to you, not too many people trying to help you. You know, you were the, the poor kid who lived with the, the old people and uh, nobody, you didn't ask for help. So 
they were some of the first people that ever were kind. And I went to my brother and I said, hey, I'm thinking about joining this organization because these people are so great. And he goes, what organization? And I'm adopted. So my brother's 20 something years older than me. And I said, the Masons, because these guys, that's what they had in common. They were all members of that lodge. And he goes, I've been a Mason for 25 years. And wow. I never knew. And uh, my brother was somebody I look up to, you know, because he, he had done something good with his life. So uh, it was one of those things, like, once I got in, I look back and all the people that I meet from the guys on this podcast, uh, in including you and many, many others, uh, you look at it and you're thinking, you get two choices. You know, you can either be here or you can be there. And I choose to be here with men that make a difference in the world. And uh, it was, to me, it was something that whenever I look at, I'm thinking to myself, this was what, how my life was supposed to be. Because any other way, I might not have turned out to be the way I am. Uh, the connections are, uh, aren't they amazing? The connections it's, hard, it, it's hard to be a Mason in prison. I'm just saying. So, <laughs> yeah. oh gosh, from experience, Ricky. <laughs> I, I'm going to skip Billy for a moment. Uh, I'm going to go to most shiny, sir. Uh, most illustrious, uh, being the father of four boys, I think uh, Ricky should ask your question about uh, about uh, managing time and and uh, just making the hard decision. I remember if that was Chance or Ricky that asked that question, but uh, uh, he should have. Uh, Feel, you should have fielded that one, but uh, that's not where I'm going to go. But I am going to go to the family. Um, the people that know you, love you, especially your brothers, uh, understand what your family went through uh, with number four. And uh, But we really don't understand. We really don't know the nights, the days, the, the hospital trips, the prayers. Uh, we don't have a clue. Um, in when all this was going on and you were dealing with uh, the uh, the whole situation of your son and his health issues, um, what one story was inspirational in regard to your brothers and your interactions with your brothers while this was all going on? Well, you know, David, I'm not an emotional person. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Especially when you talk about my family and stuff like that, because, uh, yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, oh, man, I tell you, uh, it was kind of a. By the way, I love your father in law, Ben Lou, or your grandfather in law, Ben Lou Ark. I think he's a. Yeah, ben, 92 years old in June, so. I say, man. Go ahead. Uh, anyways. Uh, you know, my wife is probably uh, is the most amazing person I know because uh, I don't know another person I couldn't do it. Uh, a saint. A saint. A saint. She is a saint. Oh, it reminds me of uh, my favorite Ray Price songs. <laughs> but uh, yes, Ray Price was a country singer. Anyway. <laughs> A <laughs> right, little, little shot over the bow at you, Chance. Uh, you, did, you did fire back a little later here. That's right. Uh, but my wife, you know, uh, she was in the hospital for, man, like a month before uh, Thomas was born. And so I would stay at the house, go to meetings. I had a lot of help with family, friends, um, because I still tried to do masonry at the same time while juggling, picking up kids, dropping them off, things my wife does on a daily basis. And uh, to do it for about a month, and then uh, it's, I don't know how she does it. I don't know how women or men in the world do it. Because it, it's, it's too much. But uh, after he was born, my wife post uh, keeps everybody, uh, it seems like, facing the world up to date on how he's doing. She just posted he, he the video last night, you know, where he does the army crawl. Uh, 
he doesn't uh, use his legs. He is uh, real stubborn and hard headed. Uh, he's going to get him. Uh, but the guys you know, in, in Mace Ray throughout the lodge, they always ask about, you know, hey, how's it going? Or, or they know more about it than I do sometimes because I don't look at my phone that all the time. <laughs> Sitting in a meeting, somebody would say, hey, DP, how's uh, it doing? And the guy across the lodge would say, oh, he's up to 12 pounds today. And the other guy would say, oh, he did this today. And I said, I haven't looked at paper today. So. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, I, I'm ready for this whole virus thing to be over with. That way we can get back to the lodge and see the guys that uh, we care about at the same time, same time with our, friend, our, our family that we're my kids, you know, they're the the other three boys are at home and they uh, they taken online classes. After that my wife has a schedule broke down. You know, to wake up at this time, do homework, free time, lunch. She's very. Uh, she is. The, uh, okay, who breaks the rules most? Wyatt, Dylan, or Jackson? Ooh. Wyatt is fourteen years old, and he was my first. Son. Firstborn, so he knows uh, if he messed up, I would probably whoop his butt. Yeah, he knows that. So Dylan and Jackson get away with more stuff. Jay, I'd say Jackson. I, I think Jackson gets like, away with a lot more. Like last night, for instance, uh, we went fishing, and uh, the tank has quite a bit of moss in it, so they get their lure caught with moss instead of. Taking it out, using your hand to pull the moss off, they take it and put it in a fishing pole around. And so that back it had a bird's nest in it on the pole that you it would take 15 days to untangle. And so Dylan brings it up to me and he goes, Hey Dad, my poles <laughs> that messed up and it was getting kind of dark. And I look at it and I said, What the hell did you do? It just happened. I said, you're lazy and you don't take the moss off with your hand, you just plug it around like this and he stared at me and he goes, You're right. And I said, Hey, I did it when I was a kid too. And then That's a George Washington chopping down the cherry tree moment, bro. It is. I had to make a Clay Mesa and George Washington to be. How bad it was, I had to take my pocket knife and cut off that line and I said, Well, it's too dark, I can't see to string it back up, so I put his pole in the back of the truck. Jackson walks over there, and I said, y'all ready to go? And he goes, my line's messed up. <laughs> Same thing. And I just look at him. I said, quit being lazy. Take the moss off with your hand. I can't even fix it because I'm fixing your pole. <laughs> and he's like, <"Yeah." laughs> but I'm, I'm, we're pretty blessed to have good kids and good friends, I'll tell you that. Oh, uh, thank you, Lord. Billy, I saved you for last because I'm an old senior demon leg. And I, I know that you're involved. Uh, chance, chance on a, uh, a a more recently active level was involved in Dean Lay, but um, Masonic Youth. Um, what's your biggest frustration? And obviously, the kids are your greatest joy. But mm. um, I, I think I know what one of your biggest frustrations is as as an, a Mason that works with. Our Masonic youth, and I, but I, I'm going to let you say it rather than me. Well, so I think one of the biggest frustrations I have is I wish there was a little bit more hands-on activity from the Master Masons. Um, you know, they'll lodges will, will donate money. You know, they'll donate facilities, but what they really need in these demon chapters are active Master Masons. Yeah. that are participating yeah um yeah we, we we live in a society i believe now that does sanitary giving we're, we're very charitable but let me get let me give you my money let me give you my i don't want to give you my time but i'll give you my money you go do good things and i right. don't want to i don't want to have to touch anything i don't want to have to but here's my money right and sanitary charity is not what we need today we need we need involvement. We need people's time. And you're right. I used to be a demon lay advisor, and I'm not anymore. I'm going to say that I'm ashamed of that. 
Um, I need to cure that. Uh, and uh, I don't know how well I'll cure it, but I'll make a commitment here to you and the chance that I will. Um, but uh, what's one of your biggest joys that you've had as a, as a Masonic youth leader? So honestly, it's ritual it is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be a ritual judge a couple of times. And uh, when you see a boy, a young man who has worked, you can tell he's worked for weeks and weeks. You nail a piece of ritual. When you see him do well, uh, I, I think that's probably one of the best joys, especially if you're one who helped him work with it. Uh, is when you see someone nail the ritual because, you know, right now, for a lot of them, it's worse. But if they say it enough, we're hoping that it turns into action. Uh, so so that's my, my biggest piece of joy is to see someone who, who takes the time to dedicate themselves and do it right. Just, uh, God bless you. Make it fun for them. Make it fun for them. Um, the... Uh, Collectively, as a group, uh, you you all have a generation uh, of masonry to go to get to your 60s or, or more than a generation to go to get to your 60s. Um, but uh, looking ahead, the the thing that you uh, want to most look back on mm. as your Masonic career continues to progress on, uh, what do you most want to look back on in your Masonic career that you will find great joy and delight in knowing that it was success? And that's, that's knowing that I have three grand officers sitting in this uh, conference, and obviously, uh, the uh, yeah, one of, them, uh, one of them's uh, getting a little tired of my question there. He's uh, imbibing in a good See, I'm all for you, Mo' Shaddy, sir. I, your bottle was illuminating us uh, there. Uh, but uh, what what did what do you <laughs> yes Ricky you're the man <laughs> salute to both of you uh, uh, unfortunately I can't have bourbon at work so I I'm, I'm kind of hamstrung here but uh, you, you guys have another generation to go before you're an old fossil so uh, having having uh, having put that on the table when you hit that generation you're 20 years down the road. What do you want to look back at and say, I'm not done yet, but I'm pretty happy about this. From three grand officers. Billy, I'll, you're not a grand officer at this moment, so I'll let, I mean elected, elected grand officer. But why don't you take that one first? All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think leaving that impression and that legacy, I, I think, is, is so important. I think a lot about uh, when you think about it. The things that we do um, are temporary, but the impressions we leave are permanent, right? I mean, if I build something, one day it'll fall over. If I, you know, it, it doesn't matter. If I write something on the moon, one day that's going to be gone. But if I can leave an impression on someone that helps them become better and, and create a legacy that way, I think it makes everything worth it. Boy, how Masonic is that temporal build, this temporal temple that we work on so often, but the one we're actually working on has nothing to do with bricks and mortar. Mortar. So yeah, what a what a great Masonic answer. Okay, you Grand Lodge, uh, Grand Chapter and Commandery officers, uh, we we know you want to have a legacy as not being a past Grand, but having done something as a Grand. So uh, 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 DP, you're current. So uh, you're, you're the closest to being a has been, Mo County, sir. Most illustrious, you're 20 years older today. What are you going to tell me? You know, uh, I I would sit back and say, you know, the year that I presided, I didn't want to be a guy that came down the road and just said, well, you know, just, it happened, what happened? Uh, I'll want, I want to do things. There's a lot of things I want to do for the fraternity, which is that affects everybody. You know, I've never been a person that's, hey, it's, it's about me or about that. It's about what we can do and, uh, as a fraternity and what's best for all of them, not just 
particular ones, uh, that's what I always say, you know, if, if, if you supported me, voted for me for a guy that would just be one that followed along, went down the road, kicked the can down the road, you voted for the wrong guy. Uh, I want to try to do something. That's why we have a lot of plans this year. Of course, with this coronavirus thing, you know, uh, I'm trying to build up an idea. I've, I've got an idea of some plans. Of, as soon as this thing's over, we're going to have to blitz get out there, be all over the state, doing this, doing that. We, I've got to schedule some things that will take place as soon as this stuff's over. That way we can get that. It's kind of like uh, the president's going to have a uh, thing with getting the economy started again. Hell, I say to my business here, we need to do that. I feel the same way about our masonry. we got to kick start that thing, get it going again. We're all missing it. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, R Ricky, I, I'm going to leave you for last since you're the junior officer in, in terms of service. And uh, Chance, I'll ask you the same question about uh, 20 years down the road, uh, but I'm going to throw a, a, a click into it for you. Uh, you're, you're, you've, you're still in the planning stages and the prep stages for your year as our grand commander. Um, and is there something that just is a burning desire that you want to look back at and say, yes, we did that, or yes, we tried to do that, and I'm dang proud of it? Heck, yeah. Uh, first, I want to, you know, there's a reason me, DP, and Ricky, and we are such good friends. It's, we all have that sense. We want to serve the organization, not about me. Yeah. About my year, it's about us. It's about eternity. It's about growing. Um, so, echoing DP on that, you know, I have, I started my first bit of pain still about well, almost four years away uh, from being done. Hard to believe. But I still got three years until I'm the Grand Commander. But I've already started my plans. And, you know, working with my planning team, that very first meeting, they were like, wow, you've a lot of thought into this. And yeah, I've had five, six years to uh, start thinking about things. But there's several programs that I've already developed and that I'm tweaking and working up so that when April 2023 gets here, we're going to hit the ground running. And I uh, don't want to give too much away, but there's a lot that we talk about in the duties of officers in the opening of a commandery that we need to be doing and that our grand officers can be helping uh, the constituent commanderies and the Sir Knights of Texas with. Uh, so I think we're gonna see a lot more activity that's just holding the school's instruction, that's doing inspections, turning in reports. Your grand officers are gonna be a whole lot more involved in different aspects of the grand commandery and different programs producing. So I hope I'm leaving my mark with that. Uh, and a and hundred years from now, no one's going to know who we are. Uh, they might say DP was one of the uh, masters 20 years from now, but a hundred years from now, they're not going to remember them. They're not going to remember me. They're not going to remember hardly anything. Uh, so what we do has to be effective now while we're grand presiding officer, and hopefully it's continued for years and years and years to follow. Otherwise, it's just going to uh, fall by the wayside. Uh, it's, it'll almost have been for nothing. So we're, we're trying to put in place some ideas and programs grab hold, and they're going to last for a while. And that's where the true distinction is. Does my plan carry on? To yeah, we don't want to re be remembered for a viral video. So, yeah, we're not going to be remembered unless this make sure it's not for a viral, mem a viral meme or whatever they're called that we're remembered forever. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's fade off into dignified obscurity. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. If we, if we establish um, a real meaningful change, uh, that whether we're remembered or not, that, that progress will will uh, serve the generations that follow us. 
Um, Ricky, I, I, I saved you for last because you, you've got the longest ride on that line to go. Uh, and I said something earlier, and uh, I want to backtrack on it. You, you, to responding to your question about with new members, uh, I want to say that I've never heard you do this, and I think you have a real positive attitude. And I want to encourage the, the other brothers and companions out there when they have new members to treat them like you do and, and make it fun and put them to work. The last thing we need to tell a new member that's come in, a new companion that's walked in the door, man, we're glad you're here. This place isn't going to make it without you. My gosh, what a onus we're putting on a new guy to tell him, we're not going to make it without you. Well, that's a real impetus for him not to come back. Uh, yeah, you, what, am I supposed to cut the lights off when we're done? Um, so you, you, you inspire enthusiasm. When I see you with the good night loving guys and, and the other guys from Fort Worth that you hang out with, uh, that, that I, I see you over there, and it's it's just always positive and upbeat. And I talked to you and Rick Jernigan at the grand uh, session last year, and y'all were looking at ways of improving the commandery work and and uh, utilizing schools, uh, kind of like the school of instruction you have as a real school of instruction. Uh, 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 but you weren't you didn't say you were going to do it. But that was some things y'all were looking at. So. Um, when you look at the Ricky Cox 20 years down the road, uh, who's a past camp, past grand commander for 12 years, what do you, what are you seeing? Well, well, at this rate, uh, I could be a past grand commander for like two years if this stuff keeps going on because, uh, you know, we're not getting promoted yet. So, uh, Ouch. You, you know, I, I didn't join the Grand Commandery line uh, for the purpose of being a past Grand Commander. I joined the Grand Commandery line due to the fact that hanging at DP's been a great mentor to me. He's the one that got me in York Ride. I didn't even know what it was. Uh, they told me in, in 2002, whenever I went through, they said, don't join the York Ride, it'll be dead. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's where that's where I've learned the most. Um, the, the unfortunate part about it is whenever I decided that uh, I was going to run for the Grand Commandery line, I talked to DP and we were talking about stuff and I decided to run not to be a past Grand Commander but because my influence would be a broader spectrum on more people because you only get so much as a Forceful master, or as a member of the commandery, you get a little bit more as a commander. And then, whenever you get into the line, you have a lot broader scope of people that you can influence to want to join and make a difference in this fraternity. I hope that whenever people and myself look back, I feel like my relationships with you guys and the Mason across Texas is one of the most important things in my life. Uh, the, we're built on relationships, whether it's with our parents, our siblings, uh, depending on your faith, with who, you, what you believe in, with your spouse. Uh, the world's built on relationships, and this organization is one of the most important organizations as far as relationships with men, because men were built to have relationships. And I hope I think that's a key factor that we miss out on uh, with a lot of men that sit at home on their dues card, which is in their wallet, watching TV, they lose that concept of, hey, we're counting on you. We're looking for you to be here with us to, uh, to make a difference. We're obligated to each other. And I hope I, whenever the time comes and it's 12 years down the road or 15 years down the road and I get to be done with being a grand commander officer, uh, which I don't think you're ever done, but I hope that uh, the relationships that I've made, not just in the state of Texas, but across the country, uh, are as exciting as I feel like they're going to be, and as great as the ones that I've made with these guys uh, on this little uh, square. It looks like uh, that show you used to play where everybody was in, in the little tic-tac-toe thing. Yeah. yeah, that thing. So... I'm I'm the loser that's in the far left hand corner. <laughs> but hey, while, 
Now we, you mentioned something wonderful, and may, maybe I want to say uh, something I meant to talk on earlier. I'm real fortunate to also get to hang around with a lot of uh, you, you brother, you companions, uh, with your ladies, and y'all bring them. You know, I, I grew up in in masonry with a lot of the older guys from the the, uh, or the World War II, the Korean War, and they were wonderful guys. Nobody behind that. Sometimes there's a joking um, uh, amongst men, king and joking and cutting around like the old battle axe, the old ball and chain, and things like that that you hear about your ladies. And and they're funny, but that those their time that time is gone. That that time for that usage is gone. It, it's not it's not funny anymore if it ever was. And it, 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 sometimes you can say things in a great way, and and, and, and you know. And you can say my the ball and chain that I dearly love, things like that. You know, then it's humorous. But I'm glad those are gone. But what my point is that I've got to meet most of your ladies on numerous occasions, and chance not so much, but I've got to meet your lady. You're not missing anything. With meeting chance or meeting, yeah, meeting chance. Yeah, uh, but uh, the the thing, my point is that. I love the fact that I never hear you ever, Billy, all you guys, I never hear anything negative about the ladies on quite the contrary, how you hold them up. And, and, and most importantly, it's not what you say, it's what I see. I see the things that you put on your postings on Facebook and, and the things you do, and, and, it's, and, you, and you hold your ladies up. Uh, you know, you're the guys in the family, and those of us that are Christians, we need to, we know we need to be the spiritual leaders of our family. Yeah, but we're equally yoked to our ladies. And man, you guys, I, I want to applaud you and give you kudos because I never get anything negative from you guys about your family and, and more particularly about your ladies. And I, I think that's marvelous. And I'm so glad that that's almost universal in the new generation of Mason. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we're done with all our questions. Uh, so all that I really have left is the quote of the week, which uh, I'm kind of digging through some quotes, trying to find something that's applicable to not only masonry, but life in general. And I think this is really important right now. Uh, Ronald Reagan said this on January 28th of 1986, right after the space shuttle disaster. He said, the future doesn't belong to the party, it belongs to the brave. And I think now more than ever in our country, in our fraternity, uh, and just life, that's really, it, it's really grabbing on. Um, we have a lot to look forward to. It's not going to be easy. Uh, one, getting past the virus and how it's changing our society as a whole, but uh, also with masonry, every aspect of it going forward, it's going to, it's going to take those brave men to move it forward. That's a good, good quote there, Chance. Uh, uh, I cannot, can I end my comments with a little Masonic quote from the Past Masters lecture, uh, or excuse me, Past Masters charge. Uh, so it basically is talking about the degree and then what the degree means. Uh, and then it goes on, and this is monitorial, and, and all our friends that are watching at our nation can look this up. But it, it talks to the point of uh, that we confer this degree for a more important purpose, and we talk about that purpose. And then say, like, we also confer this degree uh, to guard you against the breach of your Masonic obligations. And we go on to talk about we take obligation and that we smile, we kneel before the altar of our own free will and accord, take the most solemn obligation, perform certain duties, and contrary to them, seemingly to have forgotten, to have forgotten you. My brothers, this should not be so. Never forget your duties and obligations to the nation. But by death, up by purchase, discreet and amiable conduct, convince the world of the goodness of our institution so that when you are known to be a mason, that ought to be your best recommendation. Never turn away from a burdened heart and pours out its heart. Pity the poor, distress, and Let your hand be cut by justice. And your heart standing by the That's the reason why I, I enjoy the 
Bassmaster's charge so much because it, because it speaks to the heart of the nation and how we interact with our fellow men and who we're supposed to be in our daily walk. Uh, and, and it ends up in the duties and obligations of the world are not thoroughly understood. A daily recourse to that holy Bible, life, the natural, and secular life. I can't add any more how much a mason it means to me and what I should be as a mason and what that past message is. That's all I got, guys. Well, David, we want to, on behalf of the group, Ricky Chance, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to be our first guest on the York Rat uh, chat. Well, I, I, I'm pretty sure that y'all went down the list and everybody else was busy, but thank you. <laughs> they were on ventilators. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, well, uh, 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 like you, <laughs> you're welcome, guys. In all seriousness, you're very welcome. Um, uh, the masonry is wonderful in my life, and uh, the York Rock masonry is a true delight for me. So uh, y'all made my evening get to talk to you guys. Um, other than sitting around the, the fire pit in somebody's backyard, I don't remember whose that was, that's Ricky's house or your house, DP, that y'all did a fireside chat like our, our president used to do. But other than us getting together and doing that, I can't imagine this being much better. So a salute to all y'all. Thank you. Who's going to cut us off? All right. Well, yeah. And with that, actually, uh, if uh, anybody who's listening to this would like to send in comments or questions, uh, anything you'd like us to discuss, you could send us an email at chat at yorkwrighttexas.org. That's C-H-A-T at yorkwrighttexas.org. Uh, and uh, I don't know. It's been a fantastic session. I don't think I have anything to add to it. Uh, most illustrious, would you like to uh, say something to the companions out there who are sheltering in place or otherwise uh, sitting in their cars? And sheltering in place. Uh, you got to warn me when you pull those hands. Golly, uh, All I can say is I'm ready to get out there and see everybody, travel the same, get back to my blue line, council commander, Scottish shrine, shrine. Uh, everything. Six feet. Ready to go. Yeah. We're going to get past this. And when we do, uh, I think our fraternity is going to be stronger than it was. I really do. And uh, look forward to seeing everybody out there. Let's, uh, let's just get through this thing. And start. It's going to take all of us. God bless. Keep it safe. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, I hope you all have a a blessed and uh, healthy good night. Mm -hmm.